on your right and left, and then we'll get started again in just a second. Let's say a word of prayer, and then we're going to sing this song. It's based on Psalm 103, uh, meditating on how great God is. Let's pray. God, thank you that we could uh, just sing for a little bit these words from this song that uh, was written thousands of years ago that's just talking about how amazing you are and all the, all the benefits of being, being your child. Uh, Father, thank you for uh, just how blessed you are uh, to us, how, how, how much you fill our lives with good things, and even though we don't deserve your blessings, God, uh, you're such a good God, and, and uh, you're so loving to us. And hear, hear the meditation of our heart as we sing this song. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Praise the Lord, oh my soul, oh my inmost being. Praise his name, praise the Lord.
South Bay Church. Awesome to be together t- this morning. And uh, if you're visiting with us, we're really grateful you're here today. And uh, we're in the middle of a series right now uh, called Brand New, and it's about the church and how the church was something c- entirely new uh, when Jesus brought it to the earth. And so if you've missed any of the series so far, I want to encourage you to go to our website at southbaychurch.us, and you can watch those on video, or you can stream them, or podcast them, or whatever you want to do to kind of get caught up. Mark Steberg's going to be preaching today. And uh, the title of his lesson is The Only Thing, Uh, so it's what really counts. We're going to talk about what really counts today. But um, now we come to where we are going to take communion. And normally a lot of times we uh, will read the scripture about the Last Supper, but I'm going to read something a little different. Because there's a lot more to Jesus than that. So I want us to reflect on something he left us with, something um, for us to remember. To me, that's amazing. These are his last words. So I'm going to read Matthew 28. I'm going to start in verse 18. All right? It said, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you to the very end of the age. And, you know, I think about that, and a lot of times we... I'm just going to be very brief. We, we take communion and we go back to the cross. And we appreciate him being humbled and going to the cross for us and giving up his life. So we have an opportunity to be saved, right? Yeah. <coughs> but then he left these instructions for us, right? Yeah. And at times we don't focus on that because why? Because it can make you uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Well, go. But I found in my life the times I've grown the most is when I've been put in uncomfortable situations. Yeah. You know, Jesus asked us to do this, and we say, hey, we appreciate you going to the cross for us, Lord. We appreciate you giving up your body and dying for us. We're going to take this communion and remember that. But let's remember this, guys. It may make you uncomfortable, but be okay with being uncomfortable. Because it's okay to be uncomfortable if we're going to do this this amazing thing Jesus asked us to do, guys. Let's not just remember him dying for us. Let's remember his resurrection and the very commandments, the very things he asked us to do. Let's reflect on that today. And And if someone's here visiting you might be a little uncomfortable saying, hey, I want you to study the Bible with me. It's okay to be uncomfortable because we're going to study with you. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll open the word. We'll share God's word with you, and we'll let you learn and understand more about Jesus and what he stands for. And let me tell you something, guys. It's amazing. If you're not a disciple here, let me tell you, it will change your life. Your life will be amazing because with him or without him, you've got to go through things. But one thing I always say is I'd rather go through things with Jesus than without him. Because he tells me, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age, and he never breaks his word, guys. Amen. So we're going to pray for communion. Now let's bow our heads. Thank you. Amen. Father, I just want to thank you, Lord, for this amazing fellowship you've allowed me to be part of, God. All these so many people here I truly love deeply, the, the Marys, the Singles Campus, uh, their children, God. I've got to teach for so many years and watch so many of them grow up and become disciples, God. It says your word will never return to you void, God. Let us all remember that as we take communion today, Lord, as we reflect on everything you've done for us in our lives individually, God, so we can go out and share our testimony and just just impact lives, Father, of the people out there that are lost, God, because we know you have great things to store for us and great things to store for other people that we have not even met yet, God. Let us be bold. Let us be willing to be uncomfortable to move your your word forward to change lives, God. And I just want to thank you and praise you for everything in this church. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen.
So today we're continuing our sermon series that we've entitled Brand New, and we've been talking about what Jesus came to earth to establish, which was an entirely new movement that he called his church. And unfortunately, church history has created a brand of Christianity that Jesus really never intended. And as we explore Jesus' original design, this series is meant to give us a brand new perspective on, on what Jesus wanted his church to be. If you're visiting with us today, as Brian said, we welcome you. We're glad you're here. Thank you for joining us. We hope you come back every Sunday to join us. Uh, if you are a first-time guest, please make sure you stop by our guest services booth right outside the auditorium. We do have a gift for you if you didn't get that on the way in. And I am told there is something freshly baked that uh, is available for guests as well. So make sure you do that <clears throat> on your way out. Um, so just to briefly recap, we are in week three of this brand new series. And uh, in the first week, Brian talked about letting go. And we learned that many churches today are this new term that he's used, contempervent. Contempervent. So they try so hard to be contemporary and relevant altogether that they often miss the point of what Jesus was all about. Now, I think we are contempervent, seeing Jason Papalera up here rapping. I think he rocks, and I think we are cool. But Jason, you know, Brian explained this idea of, of the temple model. Remember that? The temple model? It's a religious system that's been used over millennia throughout history by various civilizations, including our own. And the temple model emphasizes sacred places, sacred texts, you know, sacred men, sacred rituals, and all these sacred things. And I have to admit, we, we break our church down. If you're a guest today, we do break down into small groups. Uh, and we meet, we've been meeting together, the marriage ministry, family ministry, have been meeting together by small group during the weeks. Um, and I came to our small group this Thursday, uh, which is held at our, our friend Clay Jackson's house. And as soon as I walked in Clay's living room, I, I saw this. Now, I don't know if you know this person. This is Sherwin. Sherwin works in our sound booth, so you don't always see Sherwin down here in the front uh, you were worshiping. But I said, what is Sherwin doing? Why is he kneeling in front of the fireplace? So I got a little closer, and I saw that Sherwin had set up, <laughs> Sherwin had set up his iPhone with a candle burning, a little app that I guess is a candle. And you may not see it, but that picture next to the candle is Clay, <laughs> Clay Jackson. Now, why would Sherwin be praying to or for Clay? Well, Clay is a great leader, you know, but, um, you know, I know we've been struggling with the temple model, and I thought, I better talk to Sherwin about the temple model, so I hope he's listening today, but he was missing Clay, because Clay had been traveling for a few days, so he was <laughs> praying for him, having a, a vigil for him, uh, and I had to have a discussion about the temple model, but if you're a guest, I'm just kidding, okay, we don't really worship our family group leaders, so don't, don't worry about that, we worship Jesus, just all in fun. We do like to have fun, though. Church has come to be associated with a building by many people today, right? And that's due to a translation error that goes back to the, to the 1500s in German. But, but Jesus came to establish a people, not a place. And Brian encouraged us not to go to church as if it were a place, but to be the church, to be the church. And last week, Brian gave us more of the historical context for how the church got to the place that it is today. The book of Galatians gives us some interesting insights into the tendency we have as Christians to get off track. And the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Galatians to the churches in the province of Galatia, the Roman province of Galatia. And those churches were made up, made up predominantly of Gentile or non-Jewish believers. And he wrote the letter to the Galatians to really address this false teaching uh, that the Gentile Christians needed to become Jews first in order to be right with God. And just a few years here after Jesus' death, a group called the Judaizers was teaching the Christians that they needed to obey the Jewish law, which was a volume, uh, just a volume of very tedious regulations and rules that governed every aspect of life. And it, include the, it included the practice of circumcision. So what was happening is they were trying to reinstitute the temple model, which emphasized, again, sacred texts, sacred men, sacred places, sacred rituals, and so on. But Paul knew that it wasn't right to put that burden on the Christians. 
And he emphasizes in his letter to the Galatians that the Jesus model completely sets aside the old way of doing things. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 6, Paul writes, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. And indeed, in the first and second century church, they were known above all for their love. And the Christians had a reputation for how well they took care of each other and how they took care of the poor. And even the Romans were embarrassed that it was the Christians, it was this small marginalized sect that took care of the Roman poor, not the Romans themselves. And then we get along to about A.D. 325, and we have this Roman emperor, Constantine, who has what he thinks is an experience with Jesus, and he converts to Christianity and makes Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. So he converted to Christianity. Christian, Christianity is now the official religion, and then everything changed because Christianity went from being the persecuted minority to the empowered majority. And mainstreamed Christianity brought with it many man-made traditions that really reinforced the temple model. Things like bishops and the papacy and cathedrals and rituals and, 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 and the sale of indulgences and many, many other practices that were man-made. And the church got way off track from what Jesus intended it to be. So today, we're going to get back to what the Jesus model looks like and, and, and what Jesus intended for us as a church to be. And in the spirit of Galatians 5, 6, the title of my sermon today is The Only Thing That Counts. And as Paul says, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. And today we're going to explore what that really means, and we're specifically going to look at three things. We're going to look at faith, which Paul says is the only thing that counts. We're going to look at love, which is the true expression of true faith. And then we'll look at some questions. We're going to ask some questions of ourselves. What does love require of me and what if? What if we really live out the Jesus model in our lives? Let's pray as we get started here. Father, we just come to you today and we just ask you to please uh, just work. Work, may your spirit work, God, today as we look at your scriptures, as we look at some scriptures in Galatians. Father, I just pray that you give us insight into the Jesus model, that you help us to come away with a better understanding or reminder of what it means to live by faith and how faith expresses itself. And I pray that we come away with decisions on how we each are going to live the Jesus model in our lives, God. Just open our eyes today, and may your spirit work. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. So, so, so Paul makes this statement in Galatians 3 that, that can be easy to skim over. But it's actually staggering when you stop and ponder it for a moment. With real faith in Jesus, you actually become a son or daughter of God. Yeah. A son or daughter of God. Think about that. That's pretty amazing. But it says through faith, right? So, so what exactly does it mean to have faith? We hear that word all the time. Does it just mean intellectual belief? Does it mean that we just give a mental nod to Jesus and say, yeah, I believe Jesus was real? I mean, the scripture implies that, this scripture in particular implies that there's some sort of action involved with faith, right? With faith in Jesus, you get baptized and you clothe yourselves with Christ. In other words, faith changes who you are and you look entirely different when you're clothed with Christ. Because when you really understand and accept what Jesus did for you, you will never be the same. With faith, you come to understand that Jesus didn't just die for the sins of the world generically, in general. He died for you. With faith, you're cut to the heart by what Jesus chose to endure for you. When Jesus had his closest friends and family desert him the night before he was his crucified, I mean, obviously that was emotionally painful, but he saw you at that moment. When he was being beaten and spit upon and falsely accused, he saw you. When the skin of his back was slowly being ripped off by a whip of the Roman centurion, he saw you. And when these blunt nails were being nailed through his wrists and through his feet and excruciating pain was coursing through every nerve in his body, he saw you in that moment. And as he slowly suffocated on the cross, he saw you. And as he descended into hell, 
into the flames of hell, he saw you. And when God raised him from the dead and he came back, he came to tell you about what he had done, the good news through his apostles and through what was recorded by their testimony in the Bible. You see, when you believe all of that and you take accountability for what your sins did to Jesus, that's the beginning of real faith. When you obey him out of gratitude, that's real faith. And when you believe Jesus' promise that you have an inheritance in heaven, that's real faith. And when you're no longer the, the same person that you once were because of the cross, that's real faith. And when you come to faith and you're rebaptized, the spirit of Christ comes alive in you. And as Paul says here, when you're baptized into Christ, you are clothed in Christ. And, and you become this son or daughter of God. And if you're a child of God, you're also an heir of God. Think about that. You will inherit the riches of the creator of the universe. I don't even understand what that means necessarily, but I know it will be beyond awesome. Right? I mean, do you really have faith in this good news? Do you have faith in this good news? Paul is bold when he says the only thing that counts is faith. In other words, the most important thing to understand and accept is this fundamental truth about what Jesus has done for us and what he offers us. Now, if what I just described to you sounds new or if it's different than what you've experienced with Christianity or if you're just not sure, please Take some time to look at the Bible with us. We have a personal Bible study series where we will share with you the good news about Jesus and what he means for you personally. And I promise you, if you go through these studies with us, it is not just an intellectual exercise. It is a very personal exercise because real faith in Jesus is way more than intellectual belief. So if, so if the only thing that counts is faith, it's hard for us to understand why these Gentile Christians in Paul's day would, would start believing that they needed to get circumcised and become Jewish in order to be right with God. I mean, in our day and age, I've yet to meet a Christian man who says, I just struggle with cutting myself to get right with God, right? That just doesn't happen today. But today, as in Paul's day, although we don't struggle with circumcision as an act, we can struggle today still with trying to win God's approval through our own efforts can't we? I mean, once you're saved and you walk in the Spirit, I mean, you really are a new creation. And, and after you leave the waters of baptism, you feel new, right? You are new. You're a new creation. And you may not even sin for an hour or two <laughs> after you leave the waters of baptism. But then what happens, right? What happens? Even though we're forgiven of our sins and we have the Holy Spirit, we don't just magically stop sinning, do we? Yeah, we may give up some obvious sins. I mean, for me, I did repent of some of the big sins. I wasn't getting drunk anymore. I stopped being sexually impure, and I, I stopped hating certain people. Um, I appreciate. Uh, <laughs> so I, I did repent of some things, but, you know, it wasn't all there. But the longer we're disciples of Jesus, the more we realize just how sinful we really are. And we begin to see that many of our sins are deep sins of the heart, aren't they? And the longer I've been a Christian, the more I can just be puzzled, you know, by my sinful nature. Why am I so angry sometimes? Why am I so selfish with my time and with my money, my resources? Why do I seek satisfaction from everything except Jesus sometimes? You know, why does my pride lead me to think that I'm usually right most of the time? You know? And, and when I just see how dreadfully short I fall of the biblical standard of righteousness, I, I begin to subtly, and it's subtle, but I begin to question, does God really still love me when I am such a sinner? How can he love me when I am so sinful? Sure, I'd never say that out loud. I'd never say out loud God doesn't love me. But I can certainly feel that way. And at times I've just gone through the motions in my Christian life because it's really out of routine or maybe even out of fear what happens if I don't go through the motions than it is out of gratitude. And I don't know if any of you can relate to being self-accused the way I am, but... You may never say it out loud, but, but inside, have you ever thought to yourself, man, I just blew it. I am such a sinner. God is not pleased with me. He's so angry with me. I'm having a bad week. Why is all this bad stuff happening to me? Why is God angry with me? I must be in sin somehow. I just wonder if Jesus will even recognize me on judgment day. I'm so sinful. I don't deserve to come into the presence of God. There's no way he'll ever accept me. Or listen to my prayers. God doesn't love me right now the way I am. 
And that's a twisted view of God. It's a, it's, a, it's a view of God as this harsh, unloving disciplinarian that we need to try harder. I've got to try harder to win back God's approval. I'm going to pray harder. I'm going to pray longer. Then God will hear me. I'm going to read my Bible more. Then he'll be happy with me. I'm going to go back to church more, and then he'll see that, and he'll reward me. I'm going to fast. Then he'll have to hear me. I'm going to go confess to the priest and say five Hail Marys, and then he'll listen to me. No, I, I'm not Catholic, but you know what I mean. What I'm saying is this, you know, even if we once embrace the good news about Jesus, we can slip back into a performance mindset. And we need to earn God's favor by our own efforts. That's how we can start to think. And then, you know what, this gift that Jesus extends to us is no longer a gift. It's something we have to earn. And I can definitely struggle with this. I don't know if you can relate. It's kind of like an analogy. Like, imagine if your friend comes to you and says, happy birthday. Here's a birthday present. Hope you enjoy it. And if you don't mind, could you just write me a check for half the cost of that? <laughs> you know, if you have to pay for something with your own hard-earned heart, heart money, it ceases to be a gift, right? It's not a gift anymore. But it's this performance mindset we get that we need to earn our salvation. But this, this works mindset started way, way back. <laughs> Just a few years after Jesus died and returned to heaven, these Judaizers were introducing this performance mindset. They were telling people they needed to follow all of the Jewish rules before they could become Christians and right with God. And Paul called this a different gospel because it was no longer about Jesus. It was about performance. And, and, and Paul was so upset and so concerned about it that he said that those who taught the performance gospel would be eternally condemned. I mean, just check this out in verse... Chapter 1, verse 9. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. It's pretty intense. He says it twice. So, you know, the performance gospel adds to the real gospel. And as Paul said, it's really not the gospel at all. What does the word gospel even mean? It means good news, right? So, so. If Jesus' death is not enough for you to be right with God, that's definitely not good news, right? <laughs> Paul didn't want anyone to believe that Jesus wasn't enough, and that's why he was so hard line with taking on those that were teaching the performance gospel. He said even a little bit of yeast works through the whole batch of dough. We can't even open up the door to the possibility that we can somehow earn God's favor because once that horse is out of the barn, you can't get it back in. And no one knew that better than Paul did because he was the Pharisee of Pharisees, as Brian talked about last week. You know, he had the rules down. He followed the rules to the T. No one did it like Paul. And yet he found out when it was all said and done that that didn't matter. It wasn't going to save him. The only thing that was going to save him was the grace of Jesus. And, and, and where are you today with your faith in Jesus and his good news? I mean... If you're a Christian or what the Bible calls a disciple of Jesus, do you really believe that you were clothed with Christ in the waters of baptism? Do you really believe that God loves you as his son or daughter? Or have you slipped into a performance mindset, even subtly? Because if you're not a disciple, you're not sure, you have to think too. You know, what does it take to be a disciple of Jesus? Some people, people come in thinking, okay, where's the list of rules? I'm turning myself in. I'm ready to start obeying the rules. Where are they? You don't have to, I mean, yes, there are things you need to do. We'll get to that when we study the Bible. But it's not about following a list of rules to win God's favor. That's not the good news that you're called to believe. Amen. Don't get me wrong. I mean, we do need to take action to repent of sin. Your life is important. How you live is important. But I'm not saying you should live however you want to just because Jesus love, loves you. That's not what I'm saying at all. But what I am saying is that because Jesus loves you, because Jesus loves you, you should live how he wants you to live. Your gratitude for Jesus' forgiveness should transform who you are. God loves you. If you're a disciple, you're clothed in Jesus. Nothing can separate you from your love, from God's love. We don't have time to go into Romans 8. Read Romans 8 on your own. It will reinforce that. We have to believe this. Repeat after me, church. Jesus loves me. This I know. Or the Bible tells me so. All right. You know what I'm saying? Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. 
Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. And I'm sorry, I just cannot move on until I nail this a little harder. If you are performing to try to win, win and earn God's favor, if you're trying to pray harder, fast more, you know, work harder for Jesus, then think about what Paul is saying here. Christ may be of no value to you at all. I mean, you may be going through the religious motions. You may think you need to supplement Jesus' death with your own acts of piety. You may have lost touch with Jesus entirely, if that's the case. Call, I mean, Paul couldn't be more direct here. No value to you. You are alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. How else could he word it? I mean, Jesus is the only way to be saved, and Jesus doesn't need your help with that. So are you working? Are you toiling? Are you anxiously striving? Are you anxious God doesn't approve of you? Well, let me tell you something. If you are Jesus' disciple, if you are Jesus' disciple, you have God's approval. Amen. I'll say it again. You have God's approval if you're, a, if you're a disciple of Jesus. You got it when Jesus was nailed to the cross and buried, and you participated in his death in the waters of baptism, and you arose from those waters a new creation, as Daisha said today. Hebrews 10 nails that. It says, therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having a heart sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. Again, God loves you, period. It's not based on your performance. Do you have faith that that is true? Do you have faith that that is true? And there's a, there's a simple test to know where you are in your faith. And Paul gives us the answer in one sentence. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Real faith expresses itself. Expression implies action. It implies visible proof, right? Your love is visible proof if you have genuine faith in Jesus. And why does Paul say this? Because if you really understand the good news about Jesus, you will want to love the way Jesus loved. Paul says the entire law is fulfilled in keeping a single command, love your neighbor as yourself. That's a huge statement when you consider that the law was comprised of over 600 rules and regulations. And to say that obeying one single command fulfills the entire law is almost unbelievable. In fact, to me, it would be unbelievable if Jesus hadn't have said the exact same thing that Paul is saying. The night before he died, Jesus was reviewing the most important things for his disciples to remember, and he only talks about one command repeatedly. John 15, chapter 12. John 15, verse 12, it says, My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for his friends. And if you read through that part of John, how often does he say, my command is this, love one another? Pretty often. And the Greek word that's used for love in this chapter is, is, is agape. That's the highest form of love. When you give someone what they really need, not necessarily what they want. And that's not what our world thinks about love today. The world thinks love is a feeling, Right? But, but to Jesus, love is what you do, not what you feel. Right. And the only thing that counts is love. And I will confess, I've really had to wrestle with this scripture in Galatians 5, 6 over the last few weeks. Because part of me says, Mark, it feels like you're watering things down here. I mean, there's nothing I despise more than wishy-washy Christianity. How about you? Yeah. I mean, for some reason, just love one another. That sounds cliche to me. <laughs> but any evangelical preacher in America will stand at the pulpit and say, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. We just got to love. But I have an allergic reaction to that because love is so easy to talk about, but it's much harder to do. So I have this voice in my head saying, let's not take this love thing too far. You know, there's a lot of other commands in the Bible that are important too. I mean, what about denying ourselves? You know, what about being a fisher of men? 
What about not being angry? What about not lusting? What about telling the truth? What about praying and fasting and giving sacrificially? What about all that stuff? Well, it's all tied in love, right? But <laughs> as I've reflected, another voice in my head saying, yeah, maybe Paul's right. Maybe he's right that the only thing that counts is love. Why else would Jesus so strongly emphasize one command to the disciples to remember after he was gone? And what did Jesus say his followers would be known for? By this, all men will know you are my disciples if you love one another. John 13, 34. What was the last thing that Jesus modeled for his disciples before he died? He washed their stinky feet. That's love. What was the original Christian church in the first century most known for? By their love for one another. They pooled all their resources. They gave to anyone who has a need. You know, the widows, the slaves, the foreigners, the, the orphans off the streets, even the Romans themselves. So I can begin to understand why Paul would say the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. You see, I, I mean, I believe you can go to church your whole life and not really get this most important thing right. You can live a pious, a devoted, a religious, a sincere life and still totally miss this most important command. I've seen it with my own two eyes. You can be religious but not really love people. Why do you think the secular world sees so much hypocrisy in Christianity? I mean, why would a great man like Gandhi say, I like your Christ, but I do not like your Christians? Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. You know, listen carefully here. If you call yourself a Christian and there's someone you don't love, you have to examine why. Well, that person hurt me, Mark. You don't know what they did to me. I know. I know. We get hurt. But do you remember that you hurt Jesus on the cross? And he loves you anyway. And if you don't have real love, do you have real faith? Have you lost touch with what Jesus did for you? Because faith expresses itself through love. How many of you have had a difficult coworker <laughs> or a difficult boss? All right, everybody, got, everybody raised their hand there. If you've ever worked, you've had a difficult coworker. And I'm convinced that God sends us difficult people into the workplace to test and refine our love. And I have to confess, I mean, I was even, I was struggling with even telling you this story because it's embarrassing. But if you're holding me out on a pedestal because I'm now a full-time minister. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to let you down. Easy. I'm just as much of a sinner now as a minister as I was nine months ago. Um, yeah. In the last, yeah, they know. In the last five years of my corporate career, so I was responsible for this major line of business for a big mutual fund company, and I had to collaborate closely with our sales force because I couldn't execute any of my business strategies unless the sales force was on board. They had to go sell what I had to sell. And that meant I had to get the national sales manager on board with my strategies because he had this army of several hundred very talented salespeople. And we were peers, the national sales manager and I. And, and unfortunately, the national sales manager was a very challenging person for me to work with. <laughs> when I first took the leadership position that I took, I mean, he would continually question, what's your job? What are you here to do? I don't understand what your role. Why are you here? Why do we need you? <laughs> and it seemed like he was threatened by me because I didn't report to him. And even though I had grown up in sales, I used to be his peer in the sales force, he still just didn't trust me. And once my job description was well established and he saw that I wasn't trying to take his job, you know, he would still resist a lot of my ideas. And some of the strategies he would just flat out undermine. Other ideas he would resist until he saw that he could take credit for them. And then they became his ideas. Have you ever worked with someone like that? It's hard to love someone like that, right? Well, one day we were at this big meeting, and the sales manager started resisting yet another idea I was presenting that I was very passionate about. And he's asking all these questions and undermining it and, you know, not on board. And in hindsight, I, <laughs> I look back now and I say, I wish I would have responded in love. But what I did instead is I basically erupted in anger and frustration afterwards with this guy, right in the middle of the Ritz-Carlton Hotel where we were meeting. And I really unloaded on him. And let's just say it wasn't in a loving way. To my shame, I used swear words that a follower of Jesus should not use. And was that loving? I mean, he didn't see Jesus through me that day. And I did call him afterwards. I apologized. But, but things were really never the same between us. They were bad to begin with. They were even worse after that. 
And when I heard, you know, he heard that I was going into the full-time ministry, I'm sure he's thinking like, wow, a minister that swears and has fits of rage. I really want to be part of that church. Not. So the damage was done by my sin, you know, but I reflect on where my heart was at that time. And I can't say I was close to Jesus. I wasn't even thinking about all that I had through Christ. I'd lost perspective about what was most important. And my faith was, was, was suffering, you know, therefore my love was suffering. It was more about my idea than it was about showing this guy Jesus. And real faith in Jesus and his good news, it will change who you are. And let's just look at this familiar scripture in Galatians 5, verse 19 through 21. How many of you have this memorized? Okay, it's a scripture that we've all read, pretty much all of us, and we like to share with people that are seeking God because it is a great scripture. And we just happen to be studying out Galatians 5 today, so let's read it. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery. That's excess of anything. Idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambitions, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. So let me submit to you that there are two possible ways you can view this scripture and probably the whole Bible for that matter, but let's just focus on this scripture. You can view it through the temple model or you can view it through the Jesus model. And remember, in the temple model, we need to follow the sacred law and the sacred texts and God will be pleased with us and then we'll be known as God's sacred people when we follow the sacred law. But in the Jesus model, on the other hand, you know, we see things through the lens of love and faith. In the Jesus model, I believe that Jesus died for me. I'm a saved sinner, and I get to go to heaven because of Jesus. So I'm grateful, and I'm going to love people the way Jesus loves me. That's the Jesus lens. So when you look at Galatians 5.19 through the temple model, it reads a lot like a list of rules that you have to follow to be right with God. It's written in the sacred text, so I must obey it, and I must call others to obey it. If I'm obeying it, I can then take pride in my efforts, and I can look down on those who are not obeying it. (laughs) With the temple model worldview, you'll share the scripture with someone and you'll ask him or her, hey, are you committing any of the sins on the sacred list? If so, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. See, it's right there in black and white. You better clean up your act and start obeying God, you sinner. That's the temple model view. With the temple model view, love is not the motivation. It's the sacred text. It's the sacred men. It's the sacred places. It's the sacred rituals. It's all the religious overhead that makes us feel better about ourselves. And the temple model is fundamentally about me. It's not about love. Let me just elaborate because I I think this is very important for us as a church. With the temple model, here's how I can look at this scripture. Okay, I'm going to look at the temple model and the Jesus model. Through the temple model, I'll just pick a few of the sins off the list. Sexual immorality. Why shouldn't I have sex outside of marriage? Because in the temple model, I'd say, well, the Bible says I shouldn't do that. And if I do, I won't go to heaven. That's why I don't do it. That's temple model thinking. It's about me and the consequences to me. I'll go to hell. It's not about love. Selfish ambition. I shouldn't be totally selfish because God will reject me if I'm totally selfish. So I'll give just enough to be right with God as long as it doesn't infringe on my lifestyle. That's temple model thinking. Okay? Hatred, discord, dissensions. I won't hate people or God will hate me. It's okay to bash Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton sometimes, though, because you couldn't be a Christian and agree with them. That's temple model thinking. Okay? Fits of rage. I shouldn't blow up when I'm angry. I won't do that. I won't throw things at my spouse because the Bible says that's a sin and I'll go to hell if I do that. Okay? That's temple model thinking. Temple model thinking is about you. It's not about love. Look at Galatians 5.19 through the Jesus model. Sexual immorality. I'm not going to have sex with that woman outside of marriage because it will hurt her. It will hurt her. It will create feelings that she was only meant to have for a husband that's committed to her. I will damage her emotionally if I have sex with her. I will change the trajectory of her life if I get her pregnant. If I'm going to protect God's little girl. That's why I won't have an impure relationship. That's love. That's faith expressing itself. That's the Jesus model. Hatred, discord, dissensions. I'm not going to speak hatefully about Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton because... I'm not going to post those divisive statements on Facebook because that doesn't benefit the people that have to listen to me ranting. It creates factions and divisions and discord and disunity that hurts people. That's love. That's the Jesus model. Selfish ambition. I'm not going to try to get ahead at all costs because I'll end up leaving a trail of damage in my wake if I do that. My purpose is to show people Jesus, not just to get ahead in life. That's love. 
That's the Jesus model. Fits of rage. I'm not going to throw things at my wife and hit my kids when I'm angry because that hurts them. Certainly hurts them physically and it will scar them emotionally for the rest of their life. That's love. That's the Jesus model. Do you see the difference? I mean, the Jesus model is not about you. It's about love. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. So if you're going to church, if you're praying, if you're fasting, if you're reading your Bible, if you're inviting people to church, if you're having discipleship or counseling times with other, other Christians, only because it will help you be right with God. You are living in the temple model. You may be living in the temple model. And if you're lacking love, it's quite possible that you need to re-examine your faith in Jesus, which should be your motivation. But if what you do is out of love and gratitude for Jesus, your faith is truly expressing yourself. You go to church because you want to encourage others through the worship. You're praying and fasting for others, not just for your own needs. You're reading your Bible to find scriptures to help others. You're inviting people to church because you really care about their salvation, not because you just want to have somebody next to you in church and feel good. You're having discipleship time so that you can grow spiritually and help others. That's love. That's real faith. That's the only thing that counts. Amen. Folks, I encourage you this morning to take Paul and Jesus at their word. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. The Jesus model, it is much simpler. I think Brian said this last week. It's simpler than the temple model because we don't have all these rules. If you're a disciple of Jesus, you're free, right? You, you don't have the 600 rules and regulations you have to follow. You don't have to go through your life feeling like God hates you or God's down on you. But here's the deal. Even though the Jesus model is simpler, it's also far more demanding than the temple model. Because the Jesus model requires you to change who you are fundamentally. Galatians 5, 13 and 14. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. Amen. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. There, rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. In the Jesus model, Christ's love compels you to look at the world through the lens of one question. And listen carefully here and write this question down. The question very simply is this. What does love require of me? What does love require of me? And how you answer that question will often lead you to do the hard things, not to take the path of least resistance. You see, in the Jesus model, there are no shortcuts. There are no loopholes. There are no workarounds to love. You must ask yourself in all situations, what does love require of me? That person hurt my feelings with what they said or did. So I'm just going to go gossip. I'm going to go tell my friend, she'd be all liking, then I'd be liking, then she'd be. No! That's not love. What does love require of me? My spouse was laid off, struggling with depression. I'm just going to tell him that he's lazy and he needs to get off the couch and get a job. No! What is love? Well, he should get a job. But what does the love require of me? Okay. My children are driving me crazy with their whining. I'm going to scream at them and tell them to shut up. I can't take it. No. What does love require of me? My wife is just constantly nagging, 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 nagging. I'm going to say, get off my back, woman. <laughs> no. What does love require of me? That's not me. That's just hypothetical. <laughs> Mia does not nag, right, Mia? She does not nag. She's a lovely woman. Maybe you're, maybe you're high school. I see some teens, you know. So, oh, that girl is so cute. She is so cute. She's looking at me, but she isn't a Christian. But she's just so cute. She's talking to me. I'm just going to flirt a little bit with her. No. What does love require of you? I'm really tired. I had a long week. I don't want to go to midweek service tonight. I just don't want to go. If, I'm not going to go. If, if they call me and ask me where I was, I'll say I was sick. No! <laughs> love, love, what does love require of me? The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Do you still think this is watered down Christianity? No. Hardly. Love is the most difficult, but it's the only road that counts. Yes. What does love require of me? God had to answer that question too. And it cost him his son. There are no shortcuts. There are no workarounds. There are no loopholes with love. Which leads me to my last point, which will be quick. 
It's really more of a sense of uh, kind of a set of questions. What if? And Dustin's going to be preaching next week about what if, but, but let me just close with several questions to cap off what we've talked about today. Again, if you're a guest with us and you aren't sure about all this and you're not sure how to get right with God, what if you spent some time looking at the Bible with us? What if you did that? And really helping us, having us help you show, show you in the Bible what, what Jesus wants for you personally. What if? You know, what if we're all just, we were all just gratefully accepting of the gift that Jesus offered us and we stopped trying to perform to please God? You know, what if we get, <laughs> what if gratitude for Jesus is our primary motivator for everything we do? What if it's true that the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love? What if, what if we as a church, to use Kyle Eidelman's quote in The End of Me, what if our church is a hospital for the hurting rather than a first, he calls it a first class compartment for the heaven bound? Okay. What if we always ask in every situation, what does love require of me? What does love require of you in your marriage? Imagine what your marriage would look like if you humbly lay down your life for your spouse because of your faith in Jesus. What if you actually did the Four Seasons homework? <laughs> what does love require of you in your parenting? Okay, What does love require of your parenting? Imagine how your children would benefit if you parent out of love, not out of frustration or annoyance or convenience. What does love require of you in your relationships? Imagine what your friendships would look like if you really laid down your life for your friends. What does love require of you in your job? Imagine if you work like you're working for Jesus, even if your boss is hard. What does love require of you at school if you're a student? Imagine if you reached out to some of the other kids. Imagine if you even reached out to the less popular kids and offered to be their friend. What impact could you have at your school if you show people the love of Jesus? What does love require of you as a member of South Bay Church? I mean, imagine what our church would look like if each of us used all of our God-given talents and resources to build up the church. Amen. Imagine. What does love require of you in your neighborhood? Imagine if your neighbors saw you through, saw Jesus, you know, through you. Imagine the impact you could have. What does love require of you? What would the world look like? You know, if you just were guided by that question every day. And you might be saying, well, that all sounds good, Mark. Love, 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 love. But love isn't the whole story. Maybe you're still saying, I still think there's more I got to do to be right with God. And if you're thinking that, I mean, I'd struggle with it too. But if you think with that, amen. But it's possible that if you're still thinking that, that it's not just about love, Jesus just might be saying to you today, you know, Mark, coming here every week, every Sunday to worship and to sing and to fellowship, that's great. Do that. But who benefits from that? Me or you? Well, I guess I do, Jesus. Reading your Bible every day, that's great. I want you to do that. But who benefits from that, me or you? Well, I guess I do, Jesus. Praying all those long prayers, that's great. Do that. That's important. But do you think you're telling me something I don't already know? Who benefits from your long prayers, you or me? Well, I guess I do, Jesus. Following all the rules, living a perfectly moral life. Keep trying. I'm cheering for you. But who benefits from you living a moral life, me or you? I guess I do. Well, maybe just Jesus is saying to you today, all your religion, that's not for me, that's for you. But do you want to do something for me, Jesus says? There's something you can do for me. And it's recorded in that Bible that you study so diligently every day. And you've read this scripture many times, and this is where we'll end, in Matthew 25. When the Son of Man, that's Jesus, comes in his glory, and all the angels with him. He will sit on his glorious throne, and the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. The king will say to those on his left, Come, you who are blessed by my Father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I don't remember seeing him. Give him something. I was thirsty. You gave me something to drink. Oh, I didn't give Jesus anything to drink. I didn't know Jesus was thirsty. I was a stranger and you invited me in. Jesus was in my house? That's weird. That's creepy. I didn't know he was in my house. I would have put out a throw pillow or something. <laughs> I needed clothes and you clothed me. Really? I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. 
wait a minute, Jesus was in prison? Really? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Decide today, what does love require of you? Make a decision about what love will look like for you. And if you're not motivated by love, please go back and re-examine your faith in Jesus and what he has done for you. Get in touch with the good news and just savor the hope that you have through Jesus. And then ask yourself, what does love require of me? Because in the final analysis, the only thing that counts, folks, is faith expressing itself through love. Thank you. God bless. Appreciate it. Especially the contrast of the uh, microphone might help. Jesus model and the uh, temple model. Just looking at Galatians 5 and the difference in heart versus a checklist uh, was awesome. Um, a little perplexed, though, that uh, when we interviewed Mark for the position that he's in, uh, this is the first time hearing about the Ritz Carlton experience. <laughs> we'll talk about that at our uh, discipling time next week. But. Um, <laughs> Anyways, and I thought I was thorough. I guess that's on me. No, I was kidding. We're super grateful to have the Stebergs on staff with us here. Amen. Amen. Right now we're going to transition. It's uh, time in our service for our offering. And um, there's a passage out of 1 Chronicles 29, which I think ultimately it gives us some insight as to the state of our heart when we have times like this where we give to God. And I love David's attitude in this particular passage. And here we have this incredible king with all this wealth. And obviously, as a king, the ability to tax others to his benefit uh, in light of the task that he was taking on for his son Solomon, which was to build the temple. We know that because of his sin, the blood that was on his hands, the military endeavors that were, had, had taken place, God told him that even though David wanted to build this incredible temple to God, that he wouldn't be able to. And it would be something that would be passed on to one of his sons to take, take uh, care of. With us, we see David going to his own private treasures. Uh, estimates are in the millions to billions of dollars worth of gold, silver, iron, all these resources that he had accumulated himself. And then upon being willing to open those up for this task that was at hand, calling others to imitate his heart. And I think this morning, as we prepare for our weekly offering and as we head into special missions, where are our hearts today? I know for myself, sometimes I can lose sight of my purpose, the decision I made when I made Jesus Christ Lord of my life. And I really love and appreciate the example we have with David this morning, the proper heart that's involved when it comes to giving, which ultimately is a reflection of what Jesus Christ has done for us personally as well. Amen? First Chronicles 29, verse 11 reads, Yours is the mighty power and glory and victory and majesty. Everything in the heavens and earth is yours, O Lord, and this is your kingdom. We adore you as being in control of everything. Riches and honor come from you alone, and you are the ruler of all mankind. Your hand controls power and might, and it is at your discretion that men are made great and given strength. O Lord God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be permitted to give anything to you? Everything we have has come from you, and we only give you what is already yours. Really understanding who we are and whose we are, how incredibly blessed we are, where we live, uh, the situations we live in, the, the jobs that we have, the community, the friends, the relationships. And then none of those things are promised, but this is how God provides for us, knowing that salvation isn't something that we deserve. But again, <laughs> That is the extreme that God was willing to go to for us to have a relationship with him. And the fact that David had this understanding, that Jesus had this understanding coming down from heaven to take on our sin, paying the price for our sin, so that we could have that relationship with God. This morning as we think through that and what we've been blessed with, let us strive to have the same kind of heart and understanding that David had as we participate in this time of worship as we prepare our offering for God. Let's go ahead and bow our heads and go to the Father in prayer.
Father, thank you for an incredible morning. Uh, just the opportunity that we've had to come together to worship you, to sing praise to you, to pray, uh, to look at your scriptures, and to more than anything, remember what Jesus Christ has done for us personally, to give us the opportunity to be clothed in Christ, that we have this ability to look just like your son to you, Father, in heaven. As we uh, think through our week, our weeks to come, uh, our, the work environment, school, the various challenges that we may have through the course of our days, I pray that we never lose sight of our Creator, God, that we never lose sight of you and what you've done for us, and that you give us this opportunity to give a small portion back to you out of the uh, amazing bounty that you bless each of us with. Father, I love you. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Amen. do have a uh, few announcements this morning. Let me grab something. Just as a reminder, within our family ministry, we have our uh, parents' night out coming up on May 21st, 6 to 9 p.m. Uh, there is a $10 registration fee for that. That includes dinner uh, for everybody that comes on out. So just uh, we'll have these on the way out. Please feel free to pick these up for any friends, family members that you would like to uh, have at, come on out to this. Todd and Tanya Spath are our speakers that night. Then uh, just a reminder, Special Missions is coming up here on June 5th. Um, you know, we're, we're blessed with, if our, we've done our taxes properly and uh, taken the, the proper number of dependents, uh, there are tax returns that some of you may be receiving. Let, let's make sure that we take that opportunity to really go after what we have going on in Mexico, Central America, as well as the Middle East, and continuing to fund our efforts there internationally. Amen. We have a uh, family group leaders meeting uh, right after service today. Lunch will be provided for that. <laughs> That's right. As Sean Penn states here in that little bubble coming out of his mouth, be there. <laughs> and then uh, there is a, uh, we've got some changes that are going to be coming up within the way we structure our kids' kingdom. Uh, for those of you that are currently in the uh, every other week rotation, we're going to be uh, asking you to extend things out to July, which means... You're going to be looking at serving two more times. Our rotations are going to go from Feb or excuse me, from uh, July through February. We'll, we'll kick things off again with the changes. Rotations take place in February and July from here on out. Obviously, at the beginning of the year, that's a little bit of a challenge. But there is a letter that we put together. As you pick up your kids today, you can pick that up uh, in Kids Kingdom. Kind of give you an overview of the new structure that's going to be taking place. I'll have a video going out a little bit later this week with some additional instruction on that. But just really understanding what an incredible resource we have in our children. And we do have the opportunity to love them the way Jesus did. Uh, we know how important the kids were to him. His disciples kind of missed the point there a few times. But uh, what an incredible resource when it comes to the next generation coming up to have the ability to really shape their lives and see their need to make Jesus Christ Lord of their lives. Amen. And then uh, final announcement. I just got texted a little bit ago. Let's see if I can find that. Uh, the Atkins would like me to announce that we have a food drive this week through the next two Sundays. Uh, food is going to be going to the uh, Community Child in Torrance and will be used for weekend and summer programs. They're asking non-perishable foods and please no glass jars. That's the end of the announcements. Uh, we've got, I believe, a closing song. And uh, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. <laughs>
Brothers, Lee. Lee. 